this is Dr. Jackie Hadna, and welcome to The Exchange. Every day in our headlines, you read about our children bullying, being bullied, fighting, murder, from Colorado to Minnesota. Seven-year-old boy stabbed his seven-month-old sister. Young girl stabbed and killed her 11-year-old friend over a ball. My question today is this. Why are our children so angry? What's going on in society that's causing frustration, anger, bitterness, violence among our children in elementary school, high school, maybe even in college? What's going on in society that has caused our children to be so angry? And here to help me today to answer that question and prayerfully have some answers for our parents is a wonderful, dynamic woman of God, they see a more, and welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you, Apostle Hadna. Thank you for having me so much. I am so glad that you are here because God put a burden on my heart with that question. Why are our mm -hmm. kids so angry? Yeah. Why are they fighting? What's going on? Well, there's a lot more violence on TV, so I think it's, a, it's, it's three things. Um, Certainly it's the influence of the media. There's more violence on TV and children have exposure to that. Uh, kids can't get away from the violence. They're on, um, they're, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we're on the internet yes. and uh, Facebook. You know, they're always, they always have access to the, the technology, but then the people who don't like them have access to it as well. And then there's a change in parenting. We used to have what's called positional power, where parents were up here and children were down here, yes. and children were seen and not heard. That's not the case anymore. Parents want their children to um, be their friend, and that has changed and caused a whole different kind of parenting style. I think there's also more poverty uh, people are stressed out. I see a lot of stress in teachers and parents and children. As a matter of fact, about 20% of teens suffer from clinical depression, which is partly due to stress. So when you see these incidents that you've talked about where suicide and children hurting one another, some of that is depression, some of it is just some pent-up anger and stress that they can't get rid of, and so they lash out. And they lash out. They lash out against other children. Yes. In the form of, of bullying. Let's talk about bullying for a moment. Yes. We see so many incidents on on the YouTube, on the Facebook, where kids are fighting each other. They're they're in schools, and the bullying is becoming so invasive in our schools that our children mm -hmm. really are not learning. That is true. Now, bullying has been around since the beginning of time. Cain versus Abel. Yes. Uh, you know, so. Bullying is not a new thing, but what is new is the fact that children can't get away from it. You see, you could, before, in my day, you could go to school, maybe get bullied a little bit. First of all, you tell the teacher and something would be done immediately. Yes. And then you would go home and you had a whole separate group of children in your neighborhood. Now, children get bullied at school, they tell the teacher, and teachers are concerned, but there are so many conflicting priorities that teachers have, yes. lots of pressure to get those test scores up or else you'll be Absolutely. fired. So teachers are really focused on trying to do their job well and can't necessarily get the attention to the child that they need right at that time. Then the child goes home, they have homework on the internet, so they check their Facebook page and what do you have? Continuous bullying. Yes. So that ha the, the influence of technology is a big difference. And the fact that children, they don't exercise the way they used to. And exercise is important. is important. It gets the stress out of the body. So if you go home, let's say you're a latchkey kid, your mother's still at work because she has to. So you have to stay in the house. Then you get on the computer. And then somebody says something negative about you. You are really kind of stuck with that negative energy. And that makes it really tough. Yeah. There's a seven-year-old boy in Tampa, Florida that beat his seven-month-old sister to death. What in the world could cause a seven-year-old boy to be that angry, to beat his baby sister, seven months old, beat her to death? What, what, what happened? What did we miss it? Something we're missing. We are missing something, and that is a horrific um, example. 
and I don't know the circumstances, but the first things that come to mind are, I wonder if there's violence in the home. Yes. That young boy at seven has seen it from somewhere. There are a lot of women who struggle with a domestic violence situation. Uh, there are studies that show that the effects of aggression on TV and a child watching that aggression will be aggressive. So is that child exposed to aggressive television, aggressive video games? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's horrific, but the boundaries, the boundaries that we used to have, where it's okay to act one way at home and another way more socially appropriate in school, those boundaries have loosened and, and they're not really there anymore. So for a seven-year-old to, to strike up and kill his sister she tells me that there is something going on in his life and I'm sure, I bet, that he had cried out for some help. He probably was having a lot of trouble in school doing the same kind of acting out and just perhaps did not get the help that he needed. The baby was crying too much and he just wanted the baby to be quiet. But he, um, he went a little bit too far, which is what happens when we get into emotion. Yes. Yeah and all of the emotions that are pent up in our children. Right. Again, like you said, the poverty level mm -hmm. is astronomical right now. Fathers out of job, mothers out of job, yeah, yeah. children, they, they see all of these things they want on television, the video games. Mm -hmm. They want all these expensive video games. They want uh, the clothes that they see, the designer labels, kids with the tennis shoes. So now their parents can't afford that. They're barely putting food on the table, mm -hmm. but at the same time, the, the media is perpetuating the, the rap singers and the actors have this glamorous life and this is what our children are aspiring for. That's so right. they want to either sell drugs, they want to fight, whatever it is mm -hmm. that's causing our children to cross this threshold yes. and become violent offenders at a very early age. Yes, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. It's tragic. Some of that I do think is depression because depression, most people think of depression as an inward sadness, a sad yes. look, but depression can also be externalizing where it looks like rage and anger. And uh, children as young as three and four have been diagnosed with depression. Yes. But also, it is the effects of the media and the violence that we see and just uh, different boundaries. Did you know that um, there was a case in, I think it was in Massachusetts, where a child struck out at his mother and it was just, it, would, it made the national news because children are striking and hitting their mothers and fathers and, yes. and being very disrespectful to their parents. So it is a societal thing. It's not just Kansas City. It's not just the United States of America. It is worldwide. Oh yes, wow. ma'am. That is terrible. I was reading in um, the Capitol Journal, which is in Topeka, mm -hmm. about a young lady who climbed up the railing, climbed over the fence, and jumped to her death onto 470 mm -hmm. Highway. Oh my. And hit a car, and then I guess the car hit her. Tragic. What was going on in this young? She was 16 years old, mm -hmm. had the, her life ahead of her, and decided to take her life. What could be going on in the mind of our young people? Well, teenagers are the second highest group that commit suicide. The first is uh, white men over 54 years old. But the second group is teenagers. And part of that is the hormonal changes that are going on in their bodies. And they're not accustomed to the, down, the lows and, and the highs. The other thing is teens don't have the life experience to know that they will get through this. Yeah, this, this too, too shall, shall pass. pass. Yes. Right. Um, there are, like I said, 20% of teens suffer from clinical depression. So that young lady was clearly depressed. And, and people say depression is a sadness, but it's a despair yes. where you don't think you're ever going to feel better. This young lady clearly did not. Generally, there are some signs uh, when people are thinking about committing suicide, but Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's all in their head and they think that is the only way to feel better. And that is not the only way to feel better. So I brought you some tools that I hope that you will be able to show your audience. Yeah. One is the depression meter. And the depression meter is a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being a good day and 10 being the saddest that you've ever felt. And I wonder if this young lady's parents or teachers or friends had a meter and they could say, what number are you today on the depression meter? And if she said nine, 
that would tell him how hard, how, how much she is hurting. Because see, I can't necessarily tell how depressed you are from looking at you. That's right. And my hope is that you'll get through it, that you'll get over it, that it's just going to pass. Mm -hmm. So the depression meter, when you ask that person day after day, and it's at a nine, an eight, a nine, an eight, that tells you they are not coping well with whatever's going on. They may need some extra help. I remember being 15 years old, and my mother died. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I found my mother dead at 15. Oh, my goodness. Went to wake her up for work, and she was gone. Mm -hmm. And back I'm then, so you know, I'm using those words, back yeah, then, yeah, yeah. they didn't get counseling on a regular basis for children right. that were uh, victims of their parents dying or violence. My dad died when I was 10, mm -hmm. and I watched him being carried away. Mm -hmm. He left home on the stretcher, never came home. Mm -hmm. Not, nothing was done, no counseling. Five years later, my mother dies. Mm -hmm. No counseling. So how did you cope with that? I tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And I was, there was so much anger in me, there was so much rage. I lashed out at any, I was mad at you. Mm -hmm. Water was wet, I was yeah. mad. See? And no mm -hmm. one got us the help that we needed because the science, and the day I decided to try to kill myself, mm -hmm. I didn't tell a soul. I came home from school, put my books down. I was living with my aunt and uncle in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Put my books down, went on upstairs to the room, had a big bag of pills, and got a big, huge mug of water, and I took pills until the water ran out. Mm -hmm. Laid in the bed and made the effort to die, prayed and asked God, because I didn't leave a note. I said, what's the point? Because to, in my mind, there was no reason to live. Mm -hmm. No one could see the signs. No one saw I was hurting. Yeah. You know, I was. we were an orphan mm -hmm. at 15, no parents. Mm -hmm. And the signs weren't there, the anger, the lashing out, the drinking, the smoking weed, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. No one paid attention no to it. It's like, let's just sweep it up under the rug. Mm -hmm. She'll be all right, mm -hmm. but I wasn't all right. Mm -hmm. And when the, the proverbial rubber met the road, mm -hmm. I tried to take my life. And that was a turning point for me because it would take two more attempts to try to, to, for me to figure out in my mind that there must be a reason for me to live. But some children don't get that. They, like the girl that jumped off the bridge, my God, 16 years old, a year older than I was when I tried the first time. And the year, the same year, I tried the second time. But I look at it now and I say, our kids have more pressure than I had then. Yes. Because some of these kids have both parents. Some of them have one parent. And the sad part is we have to begin to really pay attention. And we're going to begin to take our break. And when we come back, I want to talk with you more about the meters or frustration. What are the signs to look for? How can we help our children? How can we help the parents? What are the answers? So I want you to stay tuned, and we'll be back with more of this subject why are our children so angry when they see a more? Let's talk about the anger meter first. From a standpoint of 10 to 1, 10 being very angry and get in trouble. Talk to our audience about this anger meter and how is this going to help? Okay. The, the anger meter is actually a standard tool that is used in anger management. And I used to teach anger management uh, groups in the schools, and then I use it in my private practice. And it's a way for you to get in touch with your feelings so that um, you can begin to manage your feelings. See, anger and most emotion has four components. One is how, what you're thinking. Two is how you're feeling, what your body does, and what you do. And with anger, for example, just say that somebody did something that made you angry. Your, um, your, your, uh, your heart will start to race. Your ears will get hot. Your face will get flushed. That's what your body does. It's not a hot flash. <laughs> that too. <laughs> but <laughs> Very similar. Because <laughs> I get them as well. Personal suffers. Okay. Um, and then it's, it's about what you're thinking and, and about what you're doing. So the point of the anger meter, that's a long way to say it. The anger meter is a way for you to get in touch with how you're feeling and how you're thinking so that you can be aware of when you're going up on the anger meter and manage it. Once you get to about a 7.5 on the anger meter, depression meter, or frustration meter, but we're talking about anger, once you get to a 7.5, you move out of being logic and into being emotional. 
See, when couples, for example, have a, a, a conflict and they're yelling at each other, they're all in the emotion. And they're not listening to one another. The little boy that you talked about who stabbed his sister, that was an emotional, rageful act. We do things and say things in the heat of the emotion that we later regret. So the idea is, if you can recognize when your emotional level is rising, you can walk away, you can think something different, you can take some deep breaths, you can do something different to keep you in the logical stage or the yes. logical phase so that you can make a better decision. And this is a biological situation or condition. It's not, it has nothing to do with ethnicity, but our biological response to a threat. It's the flight or fight. You've heard of that? Yes, I've heard that. Yeah. So when we perceive a threat, we automatically go into fight or flight. And that's what happens in an angry situation. You get so frustrated, you get so angry, that you get emotional, and you're just trying to stop the pain, or you're trying to hurt the other person. Right. So you lash out, you pick up the rock, you pick up the knife, I just want you to hurt as badly as I'm hurting. Then there you have it. It's done. Done. You wrote a phenomenal book called Why Are So Many Why Are So Many Students So Angry? Yes. Yeah. I initially started doing a lot of work in the schools, anger management groups, and I saw a lot of our boys, especially our boys of color, getting kicked out of class, going to ISS. And I love doing groups with them, and, and that's how I actually created the meters, because some of the other materials I had were just so hokey that they didn't like it. So um, but I can only do like 10 students in a group, and I could only do maybe four groups a day. Uh, and that just wasn't hitting the, the level of need that I felt was out there. So I actually wrote the book as a way to try to help more adults, help more students. Yes. Because I saw teachers getting so frustrated with the students, um, and that frustration is one of the reasons that is a contributor to teacher burnout, teacher stress, and to them being very intolerant of the flavor that uh, students of color bring to the classroom. Because we have flavor. We have lots of flavor. We have lots of flavor. And I enjoy helping teachers. They, have, they do a phenomenal job, but um, they, they just are under a lot of pressure these yes. days for testing and, and things like that. So I wrote the book as a way to help more teachers and more adults help more students, because I do believe that's my ministry, that's why I'm here at this particular point in time. And that's what the, the Lord wants me to do, so that's what I'm doing. That's it? Yeah. Because our teachers need help. Our teachers need help. Our parents need help. And yeah. if, if the parents, if it begins at home, yes. and then it can spread right into the school system, our teachers will have, won't have to work as hard. Exactly. So it is a village. It takes a village to raise a child. So if we can help our parents, if we can help our teachers, if we can help in the churches, we really um, will do much better than not. I was at a school last week and 61% of the teachers felt that they were so stressed that they were going, thinking of leaving that school because of the behaviors that the children are bringing. But then if you talk to a group of parents, they're stressed because they're doing the best that they can. They may have two jobs. They may uh, be really struggling because they're a single parent household. They're trying to provide their children some of the things that we had talked about earlier. They're trying to do the best they can. They don't know what to do. They're stressed out. And our children are stressed out. So it just is, it's a difficult situation. So it's a, re a revolving door. It's a revolving door. Anger and frustration and be. depression. It can and be. And no, none of the answers are reaching the heart of where it needs to reach and that's with our children. That's exactly right. And the answer is to strengthen our emotional tolerance, to increase the resiliency. See, you don't have to just spill even if you're feeling frustrated or angry. You do not have to act out. But because of the music and the, and the, uh, the media and even some of our government officials talking yes. very negatively and disrespectfully about others, the model is out there. So children yes. think that it's okay to just say whatever's on their mind. Remember in my day it was 
be seen but not heard. Or get a backhand oh. slap. <laughs> now it's, we want to hear what you have to say, which is fine. We want to hear what our children have to say. For instance, in your instance, if somebody had taken some time with you to find out where your pain was coming from, that may have stopped some things. Yes. But then we have gone all the way to the extreme, and we just let our kids say whatever they want to yes. say. Express yourself. Express yourself. Well, you don't have to say everything. everything. Thank you. <laughs> And some of what you're saying makes no sense, and some right. of it is just vile and vulgar. That's, right. and whatever. that's right. And hold your peace. There, there is a skill to holding your peace so that you learn how to be quiet yes. when it's time to be quiet. Yes. And if we would take a, a more firm, a firmer stance mm -hmm. with our children, I, I don't want you to be my best friend. Right. I wasn't my daughter's best friend. I was my daughter's mother. And I wanted to encourage her, guide her, motivate her to be the best woman, young woman she could possibly be, which meant I can't be your best friend. Absolutely. Because best friends have no boundaries. Right. Whatever you do, this is the way we're going to roll. Mm -hmm. So if I'm rolling this way and she's rolling this way, I didn't want to grow up with my daughter going to the nightclubs and here I am, I'm bumping into the back of her, we're dancing and kicking it. I don't want that. Not a good picture. Not a good picture. <laughs> oh, I don't no, want to no. be a grandmother who's trying to get my boo on. Right, right. And right. that's what's wrong with some of the young We women. have I some. I said it, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Grandmama got a boo. Got a skirt up to here, the boots up to here, the whole nine yards. Trying to, trying to live her life. Yeah. But sacrifice. We have forgotten how to sacrifice for our children. Yes. And not everybody. I do believe most parents are doing the best that they can. But they need that release. They want that release. They get tired and frustrated. Yes. And because the frustration keeps building and they don't have the release valve, yes. they go out to the club, they drink, they and they do things that really end up causing problems because the child sees that and thinks it's okay. Thinks it's okay. And then, you know, it loses respect, becomes yes. a big problem. Big problem. Mm -hmm. And it's such an invasive thing to the self-esteem of yeah. the young women. Mm -hmm. Because if mama's doing it and daddy's doing it, it must be okay for me. It must be okay. And then we have two and three, two, three or four generations of children with alcohol problems and with violence and anger and, you know, different relationships running in and out of the house, these things can be very frustrating very because it tears down the self-esteem. These are some of the very reasons why our kids are so angry while they're dropping out of school. The, the dropout rate is ridiculously mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. And those that don't drop out, they just kind of meander through school. And maybe they get a diploma, maybe they don't. Maybe they finish, maybe they don't. And sometimes, just because there's no one to give them that extra push. That's right. So let me ask you a question. You told us a little bit of your story, and I appreciate you being that vulnerable, because people need to know that it is okay to talk about their struggles, and you have come through it. What would have helped you? Would an anger meter or a frustration meter have helped you during that time of crisis? And if not, what would have helped you? Wow. See, now she has to be the interviewer. I like that. <laughs> well, I'm a counselor. I'm a counselor. I want to know. <laughs> All I need is a couch to stretch out on. <laughs> Honestly, what would have helped me is for someone to listen, someone to say, you know, why are you so angry? Ask me, why are you so angry, angry right now? What's wrong? What's wrong, girl? What's the matter with you? Mm -hmm. And I would have given them the answer. What would you have said? <sighs> My mama did. My daddy did. You don't care. I'm a check. I would have said something, I would have told the truth, because I didn't know anything to the truth. Mm -hmm. I would have said, no one seems to care about me. I would have said, I'm dying inside myself. And I'm thinking about killing myself. If they had asked me, I probably told you I'm thinking about killing myself. Mm -hmm. And if you don't catch it another week, I am. Because I would have stole all your pills out of your medicine cabinet, and I'm about to die. I would have needed something to help me gauge where I was. Because I honestly felt, felt hopeless helpless, unloved, unneeded. I mean, I have no parents. I have no one to even tell me what to come in. At. You gonna come in at a decent hour? Yeah, but I'm high in a Georgia pine and I drank up, smoked half of Peru and drank up the other half of Spain. <laughs> oh my God. That's a lot I'm of drinking. <laughs> I'm staggering in, I'm drunk, I threw up out in the hallway and you don't care? You don't say a word. Well, that is what's happening. That very thing is what's happening to a lot of our children. Their parents are distracted or worse, 
and they're crying out for help. And that's why my heart goes out to teachers and I'm really trying to help teachers because sometimes that is the person that can see that change in behavior, mm -hmm. that can see that child is hurting and can say, what's wrong? Why are you so angry? Pain. And so if our children could find a way that's right. to express their sorrow, their pain, their anger, their sickness, whatever it is, if they can find a way to express it, they can get it out because it's like a poison. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's just sitting there waiting to kill them spiritually, mm -hmm. physically, mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally, in every area of their lives. So I would say what you've done with this book is give our children, their teachers, their parents, yes. a roadmap with the meters, a roadmap to begin to open up the dialogue right. to help our children express why are they so angry. That's right. That's right. Now I want you to tell, look at that camera and speak to the children the parents, whoever's watching, mm -hmm. that needs to hear what's inside your belly right now. Speak to them for just a moment and encourage them. Well, I want to tell you that it will get better. It is not always going to be this difficult. Sometimes when you're in a difficult situation, it can feel like it's always going to be this dark. Uh, I have been in a dark place myself, and I'm here to tell you that it's not always going to be like this. But get some help. Don't stay in your pain. You don't have to. If you're struggling with a difficult child, get some help. Find somebody, a mentor, a parent, or somebody who has raised their children successfully. Um, if you are a teacher and you're struggling with your class, get some help. Find a mentor teacher. Uh, go online. I've got a website, secondwindcc.com. I've got tools for parents and teachers on the website. But you do not have to stay in your pain. Just like Apostle had not said, if somebody had asked her, she would have told them. Part of the solution is talking to people who can help you. Part of the parenting solution is, if your parenting isn't working, find new skills, new techniques. Um, there's no shame in asking for help. So I just pray that if that's you, don't stay stuck. Get some help get some help. I want to thank you for watching and as she gave you her website it will be at the bottom of the screen. Stay tuned next week for more of The Exchange and don't forget go out to ITFTV.com and click our on demand channel and you can watch this episode again and again and again. And we will be with you again next week and remember you're no longer a victim. You are a victor. And you do have the victory. Be blessed. Bye for now. He was so inspired.